London at Kingsford Smith Airport, Sydney, is Mr. John Davis, Managing Director and Chief Executive of the vast J. Arthur Rank Organization, which has worldwide ramifications. In the late 40s, the Rank Organization was reputed to be facing many problems. Last year, the group of companies made a profit in excess of seven million sterling. The bulk of the credit for this remarkable recovery is given to Mr. John Davis, a world figure in film affairs. John Davis, I can only term as the Caligula of British cinema. I think he killed uh, film production by examining it, by constantly putting it on the operating table and taking pieces out of it. He was a businessman with a very narrow background of education, which was entirely in terms of good management and good accountancy. And the regime of, of the rank organization was dominated by the presence of John Davis at the top, who was the most unpleasant man and uh, ruthless, and uh, I think was disliked by practically everybody who had to work for him, including me. Very, uh, very true to his word. That's what I liked most about him. If he, if he gave his word on something, he stuck to it. And you knew where you were. He didn't interfere. The organization was a reign of terror, and people worked in order to keep their jobs rather than for any other motive. Most of his colleagues and most of the people who worked within the rank organization were equally responsible for the gradual and then almost Niagara-like decline of our film industry in this country. The rank organization was producing two-thirds of the films made in Britain when John Davis took over in 1949. In 1977, the year he retired, rank did not finance a single film. Was this the man who ruined the British film industry? Well, he understood the technology um, and he understood the chemistry and he understood the finances in detail, perhaps better than most managing directors. But um, he didn't understand what films were about. He knew everything about films except what they were for. He had total control of the rank organization, absolutely total control uh, in, in every aspect, in the distribution of films, in the, in the making of films, in the running of the studios, in every way. And you have to say he was a very efficient man and a, and a very clever man in many ways. The Rank organization was built up during the 30s by J. Arthur Rank. By 1942, Rank controlled almost two-thirds of the British film industry, the Odeon and Gaumont cinemas, Pinewood and Denham studios. It was an empire on the scale of a major Hollywood studio. And in those days, of course, Pinewood was full. Every stage was being used. The famous corridor you walked down between the stages was always bustling with people, actors and actresses, writers, producers, directors, technicians. It was like a very busy, small city. Pictures being made all the time and the rank contract stars starring in these films. Rank was responsible for a golden age of British cinema, making films like The Red Shoes, Olivier's Henry V, The Rake's Progress, The Wicked Lady, and Brief Encounter. You're not angry with me, are you? No, I'm not angry. I don't think I'm anything, really. I just feel tired. Forgive me. Forgive you for what? For everything. For meeting you in the first place for taking the piece of grit out of your eye, for loving you, for bringing you so much misery. I'll forgive you if you forgive me. John Davis made a point of making himself indispensable to Arthur Rack. It took him four or five years, but at any hour or the day of the day or night, John Davis was available. If there was any job that Arthur didn't want to do in the business, John Davis volunteered at once to do it. He used to be very short with 
his great uh, patron and friend, J. Arthur. When J. Arthur used to weep tears at uh, sentimental films about doggies and the films made for children and indeed some of the feature films, because he was a great sentimentalist, J. Arthur, and a very sweet man in many ways. And John Davis patronized him behind his back and sometimes even to his face in the most outrageous fashion because J. Arthur was a much more noble human being than uh, John Dee. Rank's empire ran into difficulties in 1948. The Labour government slapped a tax on imported films. Hollywood responded with a boycott of British cinemas. Rank saw it as a duty and an opportunity to step up production and keep the cinemas supplied with films. So we expanded and cameramen became directors, focus pullers became cameramen. Uh, old scripts were resuscitated and given the kiss of life or death and actors who were quite junior actors became stars. Uh, it was a dreadful period. We made some awful films as a result of it. And darling, just this once, will you please make an effort to forget that you're stunning and just try to look stunned? One kind word and I would be. All right, positions, everybody. Cut. Oh, once again, please. No, 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 dear. Cut, cut, cut it. Well, once, once more, please. And then all these dreadful films were just about to be released. Um, Hal Wilson did a deal with the Americans. He took off the Avalon tax immediately. But to be fair to John Davis, I think, uh, uh, to be absolutely fair to him, he, he, did, he was landed with a hell of a problem because there was a, a third of the cinemas were independent at that time. None of them would take this trash to be made by the rank organization. They all went to get the backlog of American films, the six months that the, the embargo had been on and so that uh, Rank couldn't distribute his films, except in his own cinemas, which turned people away in droves. <laughs> Arthur Rank's reaction to this crisis was to hand over control of his organization to John Davis. It does happen quite a lot in, uh, with very rich, rather elderly, slightly lazy, sentimental people, as J. Arthur was, that they find somebody to do the hatchet work and hard work and the tough work for them. I think that's how it happened. Now installed at Rank's palatial headquarters in South Street, Mayfair, Davis embarked on a drastic program of cost-cutting in his own particular style. One of the worst things, I think, was his sort of lack of finesse and tact. Uh, in 1948, when the film crisis was getting really bad, a whole lot of people were dropped off contract, and those of us that remained were asked to, to stay on but not have our annual increase, which was in terms of a seven-year contract. And uh, with great tact and typical of the man, he sent us all a wallet for Christmas, having <laughs> asked us not to take an increase. Davis froze actors' salaries, but cut back on the sumptuous production budgets of the 40s. Modest films with a sure return was Davis's policy. Big films he could import from Hollywood. I think that John Davis, as a businessman, was perfectly happy to see an ever-increasing number of American films playing because it didn't matter to him whether they did well or badly in the sense that it wasn't his money. If they did badly, then he could always say, I'm sorry, we're going to give you less good terms in the theatre or we're going to charge you more for the advertising. He could do control, do something about that. But it wasn't his money that was invested in the celluloid. He was not an impresario, although he dabbled in the creative side of films, scripts, actors, all that sort of thing. He was a statistician, an accountant, and he observed films as uh, people observe sausages or any other product that's coming through. And bit by bit, he limited it to films that were very cheap. And the only thing he understood or got any pleasure out of are those films and the are such films and they're comparatively rare. In the higher uh, brackets, there is, of course, the Bond films, who are almost guaranteed of an audience. In the lower brackets, there's Norman Wisdom and uh, the Carry On films. The nation's new laughter maker is on the screen for the first time and up to his neck in trouble. He's the lowliest employee at London's most important store, but he gets to the top the quickest way by turning the store upside down. Within a few hundred pounds or thousand pounds, you could estimate the cost, 
and you knew there was a ready-made audience. Some would make a lot of money, some yes. would make less. Doctor in the House was probably the most successful film for, other, for a very long time. And the day we started shooting, and it was a small budget, it was under £100,000, I got a call to say, could you possibly cut the budget down? And I said, oh, why? It's been passed. And he said, well, you know, the films about doctors and hospitals never pay. They never have. You, what are we going to do about it? Um, cut it out, man. Cut it out. And where shall we make the incision? Nothing like large enough. Keyhole surgery, damnable. Couldn't see anything like this. I don't worry. This is nothing whatever to do with you. Now, you. Every time I took a new idea or a new script to rank, he'd say, oh, make another doctor. John Davis always wanted another doctor, which I can understand because they were making rank a lot of money. But it got very boring and almost impossible because we just ran out of jokes about doctors and hospitals and the whole thing began to get very tired, I thought. When I made Conspiracy of Hearts in, I think, 58, 59, I took them the script and they said, oh, it's, it's Germans and children being killed and no, we don't think we want that. It's not good entertainment. Make another doctor. So eventually we compromised and they said if I made another doctor in the same year, I could make Conspiracy of Hearts. Everyone can judge a second time. That is to say, if Lassie does good, uh, son of Lassie's going to do fairly good. <laughs> But uh, when you get to Lassie times three or Lassie times four, it begins to trail off a bit. Now, John Davis could see what was doing in the, uni in, the, in the American continent, and sometimes over here, more often in America. And he could imitate that. He could make a sequel. Uh, but originality, risk-taking, breakthroughs, absolutely unknown. John Davis had seen a film called The Long Hot Summer, which he absolutely loved, and he'd met Orson Welles for some reason. And he absolutely insisted. Now, he never interfered with me, but in this case, he wanted Orson Welles. I mean, it became an absolute thing with him. Orson Welles, the great Hollywood star, whose powerful personality has dominated so many great films, now creates his greatest character, Captain Hart grotesque and sinister, whose comic pomposity was to crumple into tragic weakness in the ferry to Hong Kong. In the first place, we had uh, Peter Finch and Kurt Jurgens, which would have been a wonderfully well-cast film. Peter Finch, for some reason, had a row with John Davis, and he wasn't allowed to be in the film. And then suddenly Orson Welles appeared and swapped parts with Kurt Jurgens, Orson played the captain and Kurt Jurgens played the tramp, which was totally miscast to begin with. But the, the major part of the film, these two hated each other and I could never get them together to, to play a scene together. You don't exist. <laughs> There's not much point in laying the table for somebody who isn't there. I, I was never actually under contract to him. I came in by the picture. I was a freelance director. So he treated me very well. But people who were close to him, he was very, very difficult. In fact, almost sadistic, I'd say. How can you bear to be with him every day? Me? I have a widowed mother dependent on me. With all the shipping laid up in Hong Kong, I could never get another job. Although he slaps you down all the time? It is the duty of a Christian to turn the other oh, cheek. Oh, you're in the wrong job. You should have been a missionary. I have not the courage to be anything. Excuse me. He had very bad relations with his employees. Very few people had a good word to say for him. They spoke ill of him when they worked for him, and they spoke worse after, he'd been, after they'd been fired, which was a frequent recurrence. Um, the film industry, and indeed later the television industry, was peopled by ex-rank executives who'd been fired by John Davis, usually unexpectedly. Fridays everybody hated because that was the day when you came back and your desktop had been cleared and there was a note there saying, clear the drawers of your desk this afternoon and there's a check on the way. Uh, without any sort of chance of 
you know, saying, well, why, why, what, what's all this about? I often had to go up to um, South Street to see him, and he had his desk right at one end, like Mussolini, and I had to walk the full length of this room. At that time, skirts were fairly short, and I could see him peering over his desk and, and looking at my legs all the time, which weren't, certainly weren't um, Betty Grable legs, but uh, they weren't bad. And um, then we'd sit down and, and I'd pull my skirt down a little and that would be forgotten. But I always knew he would do it, and I didn't, I didn't mind. I mean, we'd probably be offended if we weren't looked at approvingly, wouldn't we? When I was directing Reach for the Sky, which was a very big success, and, and I think that Davis knew that it was going to be a big success. You fought here? Squadron scramble! Hey! There was some minor, minor thing that Davis took objection to that he wanted cut out of the picture. And he sent this assistant to try and coax me into cutting this thing out. And I said, no, I'm not going to cut it out because it's really something that is important to the picture. He suddenly looked at me and he burst into tears, which was very embarrassing. And he said, you've got to, please, please help me, otherwise he'll be so angry with me. And I couldn't believe that. It was, it was something really quite shocking that a grown man could be intimidated in, in such a way. I, I, it, it was really extraordinary. When Davis was furious, nothing stood in his way, as Kenneth Moore found out. Reach for the Sky confirmed Moore as the rank organization's most successful contract star, and Davis had a lucrative agreement to loan him out to Carl Foreman's next epic production. Foreman had even written the script with Moore in mind. Uh, he was going to do the guns of Navarone. That was the problem, wasn't it? And somehow uh, there was, uh, I don't know what it was, but anyway, I know that Ken, Ken he had a, some sort of row with John Davis and he stopped him from going into to the guns of Navarone, which for Kenny was sad because it, it was a very big international picture and it would, with Gregory Peck and people, and it would have helped his career. There was no doubt about that. It would have helped his career. I know that at one Christmas party, Kenny had been celebrating rather too much and was certainly pixelated. And uh, he started uh, chai hiking and haranguing John Davis while he was making his Christmas speech. But I could tell that John Davis was desperately upset by this rudery from Kenny Moore. He was the number one box office in England. But I don't think those sort of things counted with John Davis, really. I think if he, if he had the knife out, <laughs> I think it was plunged, <laughs> it didn't matter really. I remember that we had this edict that at, the, at a rank premiere, none of us was to leave. We all stood, in our, stood up by our seats and waited while he sailed out with his consort, whoever it was, and uh, was out of the building and off in his Rolls Royce while we just stood there like idiots. We did it for a few times, but it, and I'm sure that wasn't him. At least I hope it wasn't. There you have it, you see. Yes, men. Frightened, holding on to their jobs, knowing that they don't really qualify for the jobs that they hold, and terrified that somebody is going to find out. Look, I tell you, Mr. Jarvis, this picture is a commercial... When John Davis had the industry firmly in his grip, Director Michael Powell lampooned him in the character of Don Jarvis. These are the figures you wanted, Mr. Jarvis. Still behind schedule. Davis hated Powell's epics like the Red Shoes. His formula was carbon copy films with sure box office returns. But is it commercial? Anglo wanted. Send me a memo. We'll discuss it next week. Now, Miss Simpson, take a memo to all producers and directors. In light of the new economy drive, if you can see it and hear it, the first take's OK. Uh, he thought that it was kind of preordained, that the film industry was going up or the film industry was going down. It didn't strike him that he was making bloody awful films. It never crossed his mind that it was the quality of the film that was being made that was the cause of some low box office. Of course, it wasn't entirely so, because he lived through that period of decline where 
uh, the cinema going public went down from 100% to something like 15% of what it was. So it did happen. And he was quite adroit in switching across to bingo, as we did in Granada. Uh, some of the other ventures not really quite so happy. The hotels and ballrooms and things like that always made me feel a bit embarrassed, and I think the people who went there. Davis was cutting back on cinema to diversify into new opportunities. One was a huge success. He had backed the development of an obscure copying process called Xerox. By the mid-60s, the profits from rank Xerox photocopiers dwarfed those from all ranks other activities. But the rest of Davis's diversification policy was in trouble. Unlike other cinema companies like Granada, he had missed out on the opportunities in commercial television. John Davis looked at the sheet of paper again, looked at the cost, looked at the risks, and said, let's wait until we get a bankrupt. It's not going to last. It did last, went on and on and on. But it took them a long time to come in with a big shareholding in Southern in later years. But it was a minor role for such a big organization in television. By the 70s, ranks seemed to be imploding. Boredom rows were frequent. Davis squabbled over a lover with his chief executive, whom he sacked. Then the press exposed Davis's tangled private life, his many marriages and mistresses, his divorce from Dinah Sheridan because of his persistent cruelty. Rank became a laughing stock and Davis had to go. But he had one final success. In 1977, Rank produced no films whatsoever. He didn't really like films, I don't think. No, he certainly didn't like film artists, and he didn't like directors, and he didn't like uh, anybody who was running up bills for him to pay. He was not the kind of man who should be in charge of a business which required imagination, some kind of understanding of human beings as such, of their follies, of their dramas. In other words, everything that is the stuff of filmmaking. Under the influence of people like Davis and his colleagues and his successors, they lost sight of all this and they started forgetting that you make films and not just deals. When they decided to pull out, it didn't help the Americans because they thought, well, here's the major English company deciding not to make any pictures anymore. Why should we come to England and make pictures? There must be some reason why they're, they're pulling out. And I think it did have a very bad effect on the industry. Maybe if you'd had somebody who was captain of the industry, who was politically educated and sensitive, and also a lovely human being. It's quite possible the governments might have supported the British film industry. Davis was, you see, an accountant. And he made that terrible mistake that nearly all who have controlled British films over the years um, have also made. They refer always to the British film industry. They see it as an industry. Well, I mean, there could be no greater fundamental error than that. Film is creation on the scale of industry. That is something quite different. Surely you have heard of the British film crisis? I thought it was over. Oh, my dear girl. What with television to the left of us, uh, Hollywood to the right of us, and the government behind us, our industry, laughable term, is forever on the brink. I didn't know, I'm sorry. Miss Clark, when I tell you that in the past my films have been so successful that no other producer in the country has lost less money, you'll understand how ludicrously impossible the whole situation has become. Uh, you had any lunch? No, sir. No? You can have half my bun. Thank you, sir. Hmm. Not at all. Excuse fingers. Next week, Gore Vidal concludes his personal view of the American presidency with a look at the heroes and villains who presided over the nation's post-war decline. And in the first of a new series, Painted Ladies, Designer Vivian Westwood claims that the ancient Greeks were the founding fathers of modern fashion. That's the last of Gore Vidal's presidents and the first of Vivian Westwood's Painted Ladies, next Tuesday at 9 on Without Walls.